Thanks everyone for joining us at the Project Censored radio show. We're very glad right now to welcome to the show Jen Dearenwater and Ezra Starr. Well, welcome back, Jen Dearenwater, and welcome Ezra Starr. Jen Dearenwater is a bisexual, two-spirit, multiply disabled citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and an award-winning journalist and organizer who covers the myriad of issues Jen's communities face with an intersectional lens. Jen is the founding executive director of Crushing Colonialism, which you can find at crushingcolonialism.org. Ezra Starr is a multiply disabled trans Jewish drag king based in D.C., performing as the drag king Neurocosmos. They are also the producer and host of Disabled Delight, DC's first openly all disabled drag show, passionate about centering disabled art as an essential as essential to disability justice movements. Jen and Ezra, thanks so much for joining us. Of course, thank you so much for having uh, having me. Yeah, I'm happy to be back. Absolutely. So I wanted to start, we're recording this on August 2nd for folks who are wondering where we are in space and time. And uh, July 26th marked the 34th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I wanted to get into the legacy of that a little bit later. But first I want to start with a project that both of you are a part of that's Disability Divest, which folks can find out more about at disabilitydivest.org. The primary message being, we demand the disability establishment end its relationship with war profiteers. So starting off here, y'all, can you talk a little bit about what the disability establishment is and what relationships it has with war profiteers? So I like used to work in disability rights orgs for some time. So I was one of the few people in Disability Divest who was formerly or currently affiliated. Um, a lot of them are led by disabled people, but they, a, lot, a lot of what we mean by disability establishment is that they are disability rights organizations, at, a lot of them located in the D.C. area, that are very focused on a rights understanding of disability, of trying to make the system change with from the inside, and and trying to reform, trying to reform the system and work like with people who are embed in groups who are embedded in the in that in that system to to make change. Instead, uh, while disability divest is taking a lot of influence from the disability justice movement that was created by Black and Indigenous disabled queer artists in the mid in the mid two thousand mid-2000s who are who are saying the entire system is like is warped we have to we have to check we have to we have to build a new system and and challenge the and challenge the one that current currently exists so a lot of these disability rights orgs like aapd disability in operate from the standpoint of in order to change things for disabled people, we need to work with corporations and and other like harm like like weapons manufacturers for example to get them to be more inclusive of disabled disabled people instead of being like Hey, the fact that we're partnering with weapons manufacturers is awful in the first place. Did you want to add anything, Jen? Um, yeah, I think I could I could add just a little bit about like the details of how there is this tie in between the war systems in these orgs. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And so part of the issue is that uh, really you can see this across the nonprofit industrial complex, corporations and horrible entities end up having to sponsor a lot of nonprofit organizations for survival. But then these nonprofit orgs like Disability Inn and AAPD they just, as Ezra was saying, they start buying into these ideas of how we're supposed to operate. And so examples of how the military industrial complex is tied to the disability rights establishment 
is through things like awards and sponsorships. Um, Disability Inn does a, a list every year of some of the best places for disabled people to work and they give awards. Well, weapons manufacturers like Lockheed Martin are on that list. And then there is AAPD, which Ezra and I were two people out of a small group of disability divest folks who disrupted AAPD's reception last week, celebrating the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, they, for example, were sponsored by a litany of really problematic corporations that you could hold accountable for multiple reasons, but specifically around Palestinian genocide, like Starbucks, Northrop Grumman, Wells Fargo, uh, I can't even remember who all there were, but there were several really problematic <laughs> sponsors that were there and Wells Fargo was there speaking. Um, so this is kind of, you know, great examples of how disability divest came to be and, and what we're referring to when we talk about the disability rights establishment and how they're in league with Palestinian genocide and war and, you know, a, a whole host of really awful issues. And just before we move on, I want to I want to talk specifically about what's going on in Gaza, but I wanted to ask just real quick, what was the response when y'all disrupted uh, this this event? Yeah, so I sort of think for a little bit of context, APD has been around since the late 1990s. So they've had like programs such as their summer internship program for and their uh her and awards or like their where they award disabled people like to help like fund their projects those have been around for like a little over 20 years so this is a very established org that's had partnerships with like with google like for example for a long time with google like being on the board and google's part of no tech for apartheid um and so apd is considered in a lot of ways to be the disabled-led disability rights org, the main one in DC, the main one like with most most power. And so a lot of people are afraid to challenge that organization and they've never been disrupted before. Um, and I I know that for full disclosure, I did use did use to in intern there so so parts of my knowledge came from both so parts of my understanding of their corporate relationship came from the how the from seeing them inside as well as observing them them outside but when so when we did did this a lot there was a lot of support especially from like as, there was a lot of support in the audience and that who are happy they were, that were doing it and there also was a lot of people like very taken aback. They're yelling at us to get off the stage to in the real there's mind your own business. There was there are folks who support Israel that tried to instigate like with 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 us. They tried to talk over like Jen when Jen was reading the disability divest divest demands um, and hotel hotel security um called the police and 30 mpd folks showed up to potentially arrest a small group of people and the organization had to get the cops to leave uh and that was largely because one of the attendees of a different who's a exec director of a different org um like said get the cops to leave um but they Basically, there has been a really significant positive response online because people are saying, wow, disability like di divest like is like challenging Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo and APD in this way. This is a really this is a really powerful thing to see. Did you want to add anything, Jen? Yeah, so normally when I am at any sort of disruptions or direct actions and such, I'm usually there as press. I don't often take part as the disruptor or the, the organizer, activist, whatever you want to call them. 
Um, I do every once in a while. This is one of those occasions where I felt really compelled to take part. Um, but I'll be honest, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, I've never done any organizing against any disability organizations before. Um, you know, I have taken part in protests and things against Wells Fargo. I know that they're not afraid to sick security on people and such, but this was just a very different scenario than I'd been in before. Um, and I, I really, when I am doing like non, nonviolent direct action, I really try to just stay focused on whatever that role is, whether I'm there as press, I am reading the demands, whatever it is, I try to stay in that zone the best I can and just trust that the rest of the group will do their roles, whether that's, you know, cop liaison, you know, care bear there to talk, you know, take care of us, et cetera. I did hear from the crowd, um, mind your business. I did hear that a few times. And I just chose to keep on moving and ignore it, even though I wanted to be like, okay, we're on Piscataway land right now. And I'm not Piscataway. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. But I think I have way more right to be here speaking than you do. So you sit down and mind your business was what I wanted to say, but I didn't, you know? <laughs> um, it was it was interesting though watching it. I, I didn't really think that there would probably be a lot of cops. And then someone came up behind me and said, hey, Jen, the police are here. And I looked up and there was a swarm of MPD. And I was like, my God, where did they come from? They just descended all of a sudden. Um, at one point, I'm assuming this man was hotel security, but someone got up on the stage uh, while I was reading our demands and they kind of lunged at me to take away my list of demands. And I, I, I use a disability scooter a lot of times now. And so I was just in my scooter and I just kind of like maneuvered around him. And then I saw someone run up towards the stage and like, no, leave her alone. And then some people jumped in front of me and between me and the, I guess the hotel security, it was interesting, but then, you know, there were a, the ASL interpreters kept going, even though AAPD told them not to. And there was one person that looked like they may have just been there as an attendee who got up and was doing ASL, you know, so even though there were some in the crowd who were clearly against us, it did still seem like there was some levels of support. You know, when we left, I did see some people suddenly wearing kafias and such like it. It was interesting, you know, it was really interesting. And I just, um, yeah, I'll stop there because I'm, I'm going to keep rambling. So I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, that is interesting. Uh, quite, quite a mixed bag. I'm glad that you could, uh, scoot away from the, the security guard. We use the tools we have at our, at our fingertips. Um, so specifically with regards to what's going on, the ongoing genocide in Gaza, I just wanted to share with listeners some numbers, even though the numbers are really hard to, or impossible to quantify. Earlier this year, the International Committee of the Red Cross reported to the NGO Humanity and Inclusion that 70 to 80 percent of the people coming into the barely functioning and remaining hospitals in Gaza have had limbs amputated or have had spinal cord injuries. There's no way to currently count the numbers of newly disabled children and adults, but already back in January of this year, UNICEF estimated, estimated that 10 children a day in Gaza were losing a limb due to Israel's genocide. Um, and of course, these numbers do not include all disabilities, both ones created by genocide and all others that are a part of life just made worse by it. So could you, I was wondering if y'all could talk a little bit about this. This is a, a very, like a less reported issue, um, the issue of disability in Gaza and how this connects to the other terrors mentioned in your, uh, on your website, namely things happening in Congo and Sudan. Yeah, I think I'll make sure to like, I think Jenna's like the most qualified to answer this one. So I'll just be, I'll just be brief. Um, I think a lot of the understanding and disability justice space, and I think it's best encapsulated by an, by an article by Leah Piepsna Samarasinha called like Palestine is disabled, and so sort of the idea of like people who were born with disability are further disabled by this genocide, and genocide is 
is creating disability and colonialism intentionally is creating disability in the countries they in the countries that they that they call colonize and and that is the dy dynamic that we that it's important essential for more disabled people to be naming and centering when when talking about the uh, talking about Palestine con Congo Sudan and and Tigray yeah I think um you know we talk a bit in in a, in disability divest about colonialism and imperialism and while yes a lot of the focus is on Gaza right now it is also it is Sudan it is Congo it's Turtle Island you know there's so many different types of genocide that are happening around the world and they all tie into colonialism and capitalism in all of these different ways and colonialism and capitalism and imperialism create disabilities and they worsen existing disabilities you know just like at this point I feel pretty safe in saying there isn't a single Palestinian in Gaza who does not have a disability of some kind at this point. You know, you can look at colonized peoples around the world and see high rates of disabilities. You know, here in the so-called U.S., American Indians and Alaskan Natives have the highest rates per capita of disabilities um, of any other ethnic or racial group. You know, you can see that in so-called Australia, where there's actually a group similar to Disability Divest there called Crips Contra Colonialism that's doing similar work there to what we're doing here, holding disability establishments responsible. You know, I, I just, as somebody who runs a nonprofit and I understand how hard it is to get money. I, I understand. I really do. <laughs> you know, but like, I, I don't know how you can have this organization that's supposed to serve disabled people while you are in league with politicians and corporations and entities and individuals and such who are creating disabilities and worsening disabilities and killing disabled people and institutionalizing them. You know, how could you be okay with that? Um, and so, for me, it's just all of these issues are interconnected. What's being done to one will be done to another and so on. You know, there is no liberation for one without liberation for all. And, you know, I, I have a lot of different identities, you know, I'm queer, native, disabled, all of this, but I feel like with the disability community, we are the most, even on a global level, the most diverse of all oppressed communities because anyone can become a member of the disability community at any point in their lifetime. Um, so unfortunately we do have some conservative and right wing and fascist folks and whatnot in our communities, but they're not really a part of community. They're not there for disabled people. They're not there for disabled justice. They're for their own They're there for their own grab at power. Yeah, and I I want to dig a little deeper into that because um, uh, that that connection because I think that some people might feel like oh well just you know solidarity is just a good thing to to have with people across the globe but it's it's far more visceral and um uh like even uh yeah visceral than that um. I would argue that it's impossible to dehumanize disabled people in Gaza or in Sudan or in Congo unless you already have a working paradigm of doing so at home. So this paradigm of dehumanizing disabled people starts here and then is, you know, militarily or economically or what have you exported to these other places. And of course, Israel being a U.S. colony is part of that. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that overarching paradigm of the dehumanization of disabled people. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for for, uh, for asking that that question. I say like it's like it's the dehumanization of the entire entire population and a lot of the 
state, uh, the Zionist entity um, uses in language discussion, they describe uh, Palestinians with, 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 with animalistic language, with an anti-Arab Arab language, and all that language is also directed at bl Black, Indigenous, Latina, and Asian people here. So it really shows to me the how inseparable ableism and racism are from each other and that the liberation of disabled people requires the liberation of all people of color, both both disabled and 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 not. And like as we said, like a lot of this gen very much rooted the actions connections to 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 home because we knew like I first starting out before Jen knew that Wells Fargo had taken a a given a, a million dollars millions of dollar loan to Elbit Systems, which is a Israeli weapons manufacturer. And and so Jen was the one to come in with the come with to us and with us with the knowledge of because Jen's been protesting Wells Fargo for years that Wells Fargo was one of the biggest funders of the Dakota Access Pipeline and ICE detention centers and in pri private prisons. So it was really important to us, like, even though most of disability divest work has been on Palestine right now, that with this protest, we root those connections in how Wells Fargo is perpetuating harm domestically, like in order for disabled people to see like how those things are in interconnect interconnected with the with each other. It was I was kind of all laughable to me because when we when we stormed the stage, the uh, there there is an automated announcer saying, We at the AAPD welcome all opinions and views on on many topic, topical matters at the same time while do, say, saying that and try and panicking the, what I should have mentioned a bit earlier. So the contractor they hired to do the virtual live stream of the event decided to cut the live stream audio captions and ASL for the entire time we pro protested. AAPD says they were not aware until after that this that this happened. But it's that dynamic of like having an automated voice, also the dynamic of having a voice tell you, please, please stop, please stop speaking, please, please stop. And well, also, we're going to cut your audio because we don't want people to know that they were all like capable of, of challenge of challenging an establishment. We even, because we had somebody screen record uh, AAPD's live stream, we actually have them on recording. You can hear somebody in the background saying, you know, cut the, cut the audio, cut the ASL. Like you can hear someone saying that. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so, but the, the dehumanization part, um, the the dehumanization of disabled people it's that's such a big question that you asked that I'm like oh man my brain is just spiraling out and I, I'm not quite sure where to focus in but you know I feel like you can't just humanize dehumanize disabled people if you're not also dehumanizing other groups of people because if you're willing to disable certain groups and you've already dehumanized them you know um there's very limited statistics out there, but on the research that has been done, it's found that about half of all people who are killed by the police in the so-called U.S. have a disability. Um, vast majorities of incarcerated people have some form of disability. Um, you know, there's just, there's so many ties. You know, the 
the police forces in the so-called U.S., they go to Israel and they train with Israel. There's ties between Cop City and Atlanta and Israel. You know, like to me, I just, you can't say you care about disabled people while you're supporting these other projects, you know? Disabled people are disproportionately houseless in this country. Thanks to this recent Supreme Court case, now houseless people can be incarcerated. We already had houseless people being put in mental institutions in New York City under Mayor Adams. You know, the, just the levels of degradation and dehumanization continue on. Reproductive justice issues. It's legal on a federal level to sterilize disabled people against our will. Well, if you cared about disabled people, then maybe you would have cared about codifying Roe v. Wade into law. You know, to me, it's just like if we didn't degrade disabled people, then all of these other issues wouldn't be where they are. Um, but I also want to add um, Amani Barberin is this amazing Black disabled content creator, speaker, Um a video that she did, I don't even know when, but uh, she talked about how if they, meaning the powers that be, want you disabled, they will make you disabled. And she sp specifically talked about the runaway slave syndrome and the idea that when enslaved African people ran away, they were considered mentally ill for running away. And that instantly to me made me think about the, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking on the name, but it's a it was in a in quote insane asylum for native people in South Dakota. Um, and part of the reason they would lock up natives there is we're saying like, oh, you don't want to give us your land. You must be mentally ill. So, you know, the degradation of disabled people is really the degradation of all people. You know, if we actually cared about humanity, if we actually saw the humanity in everyone, then we wouldn't degrade disabled people either. Yeah, thank you so much for all of that context. And while you were speaking, I'm also reminded of, you know, the long history of putting uh, putting women into insane asylums because they, you know, refused to marry some guy or they refused to get raped by their husband or because they were, uh, you know, they, they were well aware and adamant that they should have certain rights um, yeah. Uh, so those connections are very, very clear. And uh, and I think it's important to do what you all have done and connect all those so that people see that, like, this isn't about whether you're disabled or whether uh, or whether you're not, but about these connections that we all have and that we exist on an oppression spectrum. I think that's really important. And finally, because we, we we are we are very close to that 34th anniversary. It was just a few days ago. I'm curious how y'all feel about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, what do you feel that it accomplished? Uh, and how do you feel about the present day moving in tomorrow, particularly when we have these kind of organizations that y'all just protested kind of at the helm? Yeah, that was very much actually at the heart of why disability die best form because like one of my co-founders like came to me and and said disability pride month is coming up in july and and the 34th anniversary is coming up i'm really struggling at least said to me i'm really struggling with how do how to engage with this while multiple genocides are happening as disability establishment is is silent in in being actively complicit in in these ways when the disability equality index rating lockheed mar is 100 for best places to work for disabled people and 10 other multiple other like weapons manufacturers like what like and feeling the need to do something and i said then like similar to how like queer and trans like nonprofits like have like engaged in pink washing why don't we look into this this to what extent this dynamic shows up in disability rights organizations when we found the patterns that we we're seeing we we're we we're both like on a conscious level as a human being 
we have to we have to dive in we have to dive into this we have to en engage and direct our attention to towards bringing attention to this to doing education or an action around around this i think in terms of the ada like specifically that the event we protested was a celebration of the 34th anniversary of the ADA and marking it with having Wells Fargo, one of your presenting sponsors, speaking. Um, just, it, it was just deeply, really messed, messed up. I think I'm someone who grew up like in, like after the ADA was, ADA was passed. And I think as I was, worked more in disability interned more in disability rights like space space that were more focused on reforming the system rather than challenging the system like in entirely i saw like more the lateral ableism and queer phobia i experienced in those spaces and the racism and xenophobia like i uh, I was I observed like internally in those spaces largely because like those disability right or like establishment were were so focused on a single issue rather than expanding out to really include all disabled people impacted by multiple systems of oppression the ADA was created under a Republican government. It was created like in, in like in the era of like bipartisanship. So the way like it's structured entirely plays into that reform law. It was designed politically to meet like Democrats demands and, and Republicans demands. Disabled people were working with both sides of the aisle in order to make that happen. We're now in an era where Republicans and a lot of disabled community are in very completely different places. Bipartisanship is not being is is not like central to disability like adv advocacy and like like any anymore really. It's 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 not something that works at this at this time. And so the ADA like is an archive that law like yeah you can go into like multiple establishments are required to be wheelchair accessible but religious churches synagogues aren't required to it's engaging with those compromises so it's like i both benefited from it as a disabled person born after it and i saw the multiple systems oppressions that Content that came that were still embedded within the creation of the law and and still continue after it. Yeah, the ADA, um, I'd rather it exist than not exist, but it's more often than not, I don't think a very particularly helpful piece of legislation for the average disabled person. I mean, first of all, it was really only made to benefit wheelchair users. There are all kinds of disabilities out there that require a wide variety of disability needs. Um, you know, I was born before the ADA. I definitely remember what it was like in school. I was not considered disabled as a child, um, but I definitely remember seeing the disabled kids at my school being sequestered off in their classroom and on their bus. And I, you know, so I don't know the ADA, I, I still, I have so many frustrating experiences with it because there's also no enforcement body for it. The only way a disabled person can maybe have the ADA apply to their life more often than not is to file a lawsuit. Um, 
you know, the CVS that's brand new, only two years old down the street from me, their door opening button never works. That's a pharmacy. The amount of medical institutions and facilities I go to that are not disability accessible is astounding. I have a HUD complaint right now against the DC Housing Authority for breaking the ADA, like violating it in numerous occasions. You know, so even with its existence, it's still not doing that much for disabled people, in my opinion. Um, there was even a case that thankfully uh, the Supreme Court dismissed it as moot, but um, the Atkinson Hotels versus Laufer case where there was actually an attempt to strip away the power of disabled people to file lawsuits against businesses that did not provide disability services under the ADA. You know, so it's it's just this legislation where I'm like, eh, it kind of exists in name only and even in name, it's not that great. I mean, the way I get treated even in federal government buildings is absurd. I was invited several years back to an event at the US Capitol and I came in with my cane and the, the security guard was instantly like, do you need that? just on me. And I looked at him, I was like, yes, you can't put it through the conveyor belt. And at that point, I was just like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. You can wand me. And I said, well, I'm disabled and need this. And I'm here as a guest for a disability event, no less. Ugh. They just seem so perturbed to have to wand me as opposed to me just throwing my cane on the conveyor belt and walking through the, you know, the security apparatus thing <laughs> um you know that's the government so i i don't know i i've rambled a bit as i tend to do but the ada eh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> i mean it sounds like a lot of things that the government does eh, like you you fell backwards into something that was kind of good but not really mm -hmm. um yeah, absolutely. And also it's just so like, why would you bring a cane if you didn't need it? Like, what am I going to do? Putting on the Ritz? Like, I'm not here to do like, that's so bizarre. Exactly. Exactly. Like, do you think that disabled people are treated so well that able-bodied people are out here imitating us and buying and putting money into mobility equipment to pretend to be disabled? Are you kidding me? That's... Of course I need the damn cane. Shoot. I'm sorry. I forgot. I cursed. That's, so, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so bizarre. Um, well, anyway, Jen and Ezra, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. If folks want to learn more about disability divest, including reading the demands that, uh, that, that Jen, in case you weren't there to hear them when Jen read them out, uh, you can visit disabilitydivest.org. Are there any other sites or places that you'd like people to know about before we sign off? Yeah, I think we do have, we do have our our own um, Instagram and that is at disability divest and where you can see um, all of our all of our posts and in our bio like we have a link tree that includes um, a demand letter where you can sign on to the demand the, the demands letter as an individual and in in a, where a group can reach out to us to say if they want to endorse as as a group, and in, I think most importantly, we also have include our link tree um, links to fundraisers for for disabled people and and Palestinian families with disabled members who are raising money to evacuate evacuate Gaza and we want to encourage people to donate to those. We also include a link to Crips for eSIMS for Gaza, which is an initiative started by Leah Piepsna Samara Sinha and Alice Alice Wan to donate eSIMS to to Palestinians and in, in Gaza and we also have Twitter that's disability uh, divest because for some reason we couldn't do disability divest on X. Um, so you have Twitter and TikTok as well. I would say like our Instagram at, at disability divest and our 
and our website, um, disabilitydivest.org, is our is our main places is our main places places to be. Um, our we have an actions tab that includes both our letter to AAPD and our letter to Disability In, um, and we and our letter is available in in AS has an ASL version and a plain language version for people with developmental disabilities. Anything to add, Jen, before we wrap up? All right. Well, thank you all so much for taking the time to sit down with us. Really appreciate you uh, you being here. Thank you for having us here. Of course. Thank thank you for having me on the having me and Jen on the show.